Hello, Michael. Welcome to our uh, virtual newsroom. So thank you so much for being here. It's such a great honor to have you here. Um, so Michael, you are the director of the East Asia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, a DC think tank. Uh, you know, I read many of your policy reports, your policy recommendations, and I read them with relish, but uh, some of our audience might not be familiar with the Quincy Institute. Can you just first introduce us to the Quincy Institute a little more? Uh, what is it about? What is the mission? And what are some of your current projects? Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thanks very much for having me, Lizzie. Uh, the Quincy Institute, I, I'm recent, I just recently joined the Quincy Institute last uh, fall, and uh, it's a new think tank in Washington and a very different think tank. It was set up at the end of uh, 2019, and its purpose, its dedication, its motivation is to advocate for greater restraint in American foreign policy, particularly a lowering of America's reliance on military instruments and the use of the military to support foreign policy, uh, to certainly have a military and a strong military, but not to be as interventionist in the military and not to be as sort of globe, global spanning and as oriented towards American primacy as the United States has been, um, especially in places like the Middle East and, and uh, in Asia. Uh, so it advocates for greater restraint, greater stress on diplomatic initiatives, uh, more inclusivity, uh, less of an emphasis on great power strategic competition, more of an emphasis on dealing with global problems that all countries face, climate change, the pandemic we're in now and future pandemics, and uh, domestic issues like populist nationalism that are threats to the security of uh, democracies around the world. Uh, so it's, it's a very different kind of think tank. It, and it's also an advocacy uh, tank, not just a think tank, but what you call a do tank. So it's got contacts on the Hill. It's actively trying to promote different policies. Um, it's in, engaging with policymakers and politicians and members of the public. So it's not just uh, writing documents and giving briefings. It's really very much more kind of a, an advocacy organization. It's relatively small. Um, but it's growing quite quickly and it's getting increasing levels of support because I think there's increasing support within the American public for the kind of um, values and objectives that the uh, Quincy Institute has. So as you said, I am the director of the East Asia program and it's a small program, only four people in it, but it's been very active. Uh, we just recently came out with a major report on uh, US strategy in East Asia which tries to encompass many of the values and attitudes that I just described that Quincy holds. Um, and, and it's um, getting a lot of coverage, a lot of response from different areas. So we're doing a rollout for it uh, very soon. And we've been engaging with people on the Hill, uh, Capitol Hill to, uh, to present it and to other audiences as well. Um, in connection with that report and that activity, we're doing a major project to try and reassess what America's force posture should be in Asia. Um, we believe that the United States is not going to be able to sustain the past position of military primacy it had in the region. And also there are reasons why it just should not do that. And it needs to transition to a less escalatory, less provocative, defensive oriented force posture that can still protect American interests and those of America's friends and allies, but without relying on the rhetoric and the stance and the force posture and the doctrine of the past, um, which, um, as I say, is really no longer feasible. Um, in addition to that, we're, uh, do, we're engaging with uh, colleagues in China on issues involving crisis management, how to avoid a future possible crisis between the United States and China, and if one were to occur, how to manage it effectively so that it is, it is de-escalated and diffused without damaging the interests of the United States. Um, and that's been going on for some time. And then we have uh, projects relating to uh, North Korea. Um, one of the colleagues in the, uh, in the East Asia program, Jess Lee is a Korea specialist and we're advocating for moving forward with a peace regime on the mm -hmm. Korean peninsula to try and reduce military tension in that area as well. So uh, we're doing quite a lot for a relatively small think tank and a relatively small uh, program, but. Um, we're, we're really heartened by the response that we're getting. And uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna be continuing to grow. 
Thank you so much. That's a great introduction. And uh, so I will include a link to the report principles to get a new U.S. strategy in East, in East Asia uh, right. in the show notes. So, you know, um, oh, our right. audience who are interested will, can take a look. Well, and also, you. you know, one of uh, the authors of the report, Jessica Lee, happens to be a Wellesley alum. Oh, uh, are you a Wellesley alum? Yes, I also graduated from Wellesley. Uh, a few oh, years ago. okay. That's great. Yeah, yeah Jess is great. a Wellesley alum. I know. Yes, yeah. Oh. Next time when we uh, move on to talk about Korean related topics, we'll make sure to invite Jessica Lee to the Oh, show. yeah. Hi, right, Jess. She's great. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, I read the report. It's super refreshing and very insightful, uh, in my own opinion. But that's also sort of very different from what the Trump administration has been doing in the past four years. But before we uh, move on to discuss the Trump administration, I wanted to take a look back in history a little bit. So when we talk about U.S. strategy in East Asia, uh, sort of in the previous two administrations, there are two terms that immediately came to mind. First is the Obama era's rebalance to Asia approach. Then in the Trump administration, or more specifically starting in 2018, uh, you know, White House has been calling for a free and open in the Pacific, FOIP, uh, right. which basically is this idea of, you know, building a strong coalition of regional democracies in Asia to counter uh, the challenges posed by, by uh, China. Uh, in your foreign affairs article published in 2018, you call that and unbalance is equal to the rebalance. So can you unpack that statement a little, little more and elaborate on the differences between the two approaches a little more? Well, I think that the, the Obama approach was an effort to try to um, inform the region and the world that even though the United States was going to be drawing down in the Middle East, it was certainly not withdrawing from its engagement in other parts of the world and in particular was not doing so in Asia. Um, I think the word pivot was a poorly chosen word. Um, it really sort of implies that the United States had been ignoring Asia for years and that now it was going to pivot over to looking at Asia and of course it could pivot away again. So the, the idea, the concept was not a terribly good one in terms of using that word. Um, but I think that the intention of reasserting sort of American interest in or strengthening American interest in um, the Asia Pacific was a valid one. I think the United States needs to remain very active uh, and very supportive of the region in a whole variety of different ways. And in many ways it is, it is indeed an Asian power. So I think it, it really uh, did reflect a need, but unfortunately the pivot itself really became something that many people looked at as a shift against China that it was a shift to the region that was provoked by Chinese behavior and that the United States was going to be in implementing the pivot, basically adopting a lot of policies that seemed to be somewhat zero sum in dealing with China. And that I think was unfortunate. I don't think that that necessarily was the intention of everybody within the Obama administration. They certainly were more concerned about Chinese behavior in certain areas but I don't think that they simply wanted to define this as an anti-China move. Now, the free and open Indo-Pacific concept is somewhat different. I mean, it, it has evolved over time. It first emerged um, under uh, Japanese auspices, uh, Shinzo Abe, the former prime minister of Japan really raised this concept initially. And the whole idea behind it was to support the idea of peace, stability, and freedom of navigation across the Pacific and specifically was designed to uh, emphasize that Japan or to say that Japan needed to play a bigger role in that regard in supporting freedom of navigation across the Pacific. So it was a fairly, and also supporting peace and stability. So, I mean, these are all kind of mom and apple pie sorts of values that anybody can get behind. Everybody wants peace, stability and the continuation of free commerce across the Pacific. So uh, there was nothing terribly um, objectionable to what Abe was trying to do and say, and he was trying to encourage a greater role for Japan, which was also good. Now, under the Trump administration, the whole free and open Indo-Pacific took on a very different meaning. For the Trump administration, it was all about opposing China. It was all about a zero sum competition with China, and it was about bringing together other democracies in the region, particularly uh, Japan, Australia and India alongside the US, what is known as the Quad, as a core of anti-China countries that would basically adopt uh, US-led or US-determined policies towards China 
in pushing back against China virtually across the board in almost every area with no real thought given to where we might need to cooperate with China and work with China to get positive sum outcomes. So it was a very anti-China document and it was a polarizing document. It was a document that would have really polarized the region. And in part it would have done that because the other Asian democracies in the region were not nearly as signed on to, not nearly as supportive of the extreme zero sum position uh, of the United States under Trump in, in trying to implement the free and open Indo-Pacific. So those countries have not really lined up with the United States under Trump to conduct this very much anti-China strategy in Asia. Um, Asian countries are not convinced that that approach, that degree of zero sum approach, hostile approach is what they think will maintain peace and stability in the region. So it's taken on a very different gloss under the Trump administration. And as a result of that, it hasn't gotten very far. It's really just still consists of a lot of statements, some meetings, but not a whole lot in terms of really substantive actions. And I think that's because it's really a flawed concept in the way it's uh, enunciated by the, or the way it had been enunciated by the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. I see. So, you know, as you, as you mentioned, I think many people were concerned about the direction of the U.S.-China relationship under the Trump administration. And that's why, you know, after the election, people were more or less relieved that, OK, so at least it seems like we're not heading to a all out hot war. Mm -hmm. uh, might be a Cold War 2.0, who knows, but at least there's no immediate danger to, you know, heading in that direction. But what's really interesting and perhaps a little surprising is that even in its final days of power, the Trump administration was still like launching slews of major last minute policy changes, you know, right. aimed at China. I remember, you know, just 10 days before leaving office over this weekend, Pompeo suddenly announced that the United States will be uh, rolling back self-imposed restrictions between American and Taiwanese officials. And that move immediately drew swift condemnation from officials in Beijing, which is not surprising. And then there was also this last minute flurry of activity, including, you know, adding companies like, Xiaomi, the Chinese mobile phone manufacturing to the blacklist and, you know, giving uh, U.S. Commerce Department powers to block imports from countries like China deemed as security threats. Right. And finally, we saw the Trump administration declassify this Indo-Pacific document that you were just talking about right. only eight days before its departure. So why is that? What's the motivation behind that? Is it a way to like cement the Trump's China strategy legacy or was it like, how, how do you explain that move just eight days before departure? Oh, I think these moves were very, very much deliberately calculated to put pressure on the Biden administration to endorse uh, the details of the Trump uh, approach to Asia and to China, um, knowing that many uh, in Congress and elsewhere in Washington take a pretty zero sum and in some cases hostile stance toward China. And they wanted to use that sentiment uh, to try to box in the Biden administration and limit their options in dealing with China into ones that were similar to what the Trump administration had been taking, which was really resulting in a pretty abject failure. I mean, their, their, their China policies have not succeeded, certainly not in the economic realm, they haven't succeeded. And even in the uh, military realm, they haven't really succeeded. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they, they were too excessively hostile and too zero sum, as I, as I say. So I think that that's really what was uh, behind the entire, uh, all these activities. I think the Trump administration's last minute uh, effort to lift uh, limitations on US-Taiwan relations was really a danger. That, that in particular, if it, if it is implemented in the way in which it seems to be uh, intended, um, I think that would move us much, much closer to confrontation, if not conflict, with the Chinese over the Taiwan issue and totally unnecessarily. Um, I don't think we're looking at an imminent war with China over Taiwan. Yes, I think there are trends going on that are really making the situation much more unstable than it has been. But these actions are being taken by all sides in this. And there tend to be an interactive dynamic involved that is a very negative one, which is basically focused, particularly between the US and China, on showing signals of resolve deterrence resolve on the part of both sides towards the other. And there's no real effort to engage on how you might try to stabilize this situation. For the United States, a critical element in stabilizing or maintaining stability 
is to, is to continue with the American, basic American policy about Taiwan, which is essentially the three communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act, and very importantly, the one China policy. That policy, the uh, willingness of the United States to not challenge the Chinese position that Taiwan is a part of China, and China's willingness in return to stress or pursue a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue as a first priority, that understanding has kept stability in Asia now for over 40 years. And if the United States transitions to a position where it is in effect discarding the one China policy and moving ever closer to Taiwan and treating it in effect as a de facto sovereign nation, then we are gonna be moving into a much more dangerous set of circumstances where the US and China really are gonna be doubling down on their efforts to deter each other. And the Chinese are gonna be, I think, exerting much stronger efforts than they've done even thus far in trying to, def in trying to deter the United States. And that will, I think, be a recipe for disaster in the future. And we have to stop that dynamic. So the Trump administration, they think they're deterring China by doing this. And they think they're supporting a democratic friend by doing this. But the underlying dynamic, the underlying reality of the situation is they are reinforcing the negative aspects of this situation. They're making it more, not less likely to have conflict over Taiwan. So I think the Biden administration needs to seriously reassess the Trump policies towards Taiwan and towards China in general. It needs to back away from this zero sum hostile stance that the Trump administration had taken in every area. It needs to assess each of the different functional areas of policy both separately and in terms of how they relate, relate to each other. And it needs to recognize that the US and China cannot avoid cooperating in many areas in order to address critical problems, critical challenges that not only the two countries face, but the entire world faces. China is too deeply embedded in the international system. It has too many cross-cutting interests um, uh, or as common interests, I should say, with the United States and other countries around the world to simply treat it as a pariah and as a threat to all nations. Um, this is a totally unrealistic policy line and it has to be replaced by something that recognizes the complexities of the US-China relationship and China's relationship to the world and is able to both deter bad Chinese behavior in areas where it really counts and using genuinely effective policies, but at the same time recognize that that's not all of what the US policy towards China is about and should seriously seek to strengthen the ability to work with the Chinese on many areas where it's essential to do so. And I hope the Biden administration does implement those kinds of policies. I think it needs to conduct a serious China policy review and reassess where the United States stands with regard to China, how US friends and allies regard China and Asia and adjust its policy position or the Trump policy position accordingly. All right. Well, thank you for that really insightful reading to that uh, approach. So now we have this declassified version of the document. I wonder, compared with uh, what we already knew back in uh, 2018, does the new declassified version of the document provide any new information or does it more or less just reinforce what we already know about the approach? Oh, I don't think it provides much in the way of new information. I think it just ex extends, provides greater details about the different elements of what the Trump policy had been towards uh, towards Asia, towards the Indo-Pacific. And it was all about opposing China. I mean, that, that was the essence of it. There was very little else in it. Now, it made some statements about US interests in some regards and about the region that were not inaccurate, that we're talking about the need to have continuation of uh, free and open Pacific in the sense of uh, freedom of navigation, um, to have a uh, continuation of certain types of values and norms that the region has been upholding uh, and to engage with the region in meaningful ways to try and uh, maintain peace and stability across the region. But uh, I hasten to add that the prism through which all of these things were viewed in the document was very fundamentally flawed. First of all, it emphasized America first as, I mean, this 
is just written through the whole document that it's really about what is America's um, what are America's uh, objectives in Asia and how do we get other countries to toe the line and support American objectives? And of course, again, those objectives are anti-China. So it's, it's a document that really sounds extremely self-centered. Uh, and, you know, here's our views. We have to make sure everybody accepts and pulls and supports these views and uh, is with us in, in basically countering China. So that is, I think, a wrong approach. It has to be much more consultative. It has to be with much more listening on the part of the United States, as opposed to dictating what other countries should be doing. And it has to be much more oriented towards reaching some kind of positive sum outcomes, not just zero sum with the Chinese. Secondly, I think it's over militarized. I mean, it, it asserts the need uh, for the United States to maintain, I mean, it explicitly says maintain American primacy in Asia. I mean, this concept is dead. This concept has gone away. The United States has never held primacy over all of Asia. Um, it has had primacy in a military sense across much of maritime Asia, for sure, for 70 years. But that is gone. The United States does not have that level of primacy. And the costs of trying to bring that back, both financially and politically and in security terms, in my view, would be exorbitant. And I doubt the United States even could do it. Uh, in terms of the feasibility of it. So uh, that is a concept that should no longer be animating US policy in the region, but it just infuses that document. And it's, 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 a, it's a concept that is still widely upheld and widely regarded in Washington, but people in Washington need to recognize that the region has changed fundamentally. China's position in the region is far more important than it has been in the past and its ability to operate near its shores in a military sense is extremely strong, much stronger than it was, has been in the past. And so the United States operating from basically, um, well, thousands of miles away if you're talking about the continental US or Hawaii, but even if you're talking about Japan and US bases in Japan, which are very close to China and exposed to Chinese capabilities, particularly ballistic missiles, the United States simply cannot operate in a position of establishing primacy militarily over China along its seaboard. That is just not gonna work. So it has to have a policy that is more oriented to creating stability in the region through what we would advocate at Quincy, at the Quincy Institute as a mutual denial force posture. One that prevents either side from gaining control over vital sea and airspace along the Chinese periphery. And neither is going to, neither China nor the US is going to dominate Asia militarily. So they have to start thinking about how to create a stable balance between the US and its friends and allies and China in the Western Pacific, one that does not further polarization and further confrontation. That's what the United States has to begin doing. And then it has to reflect that in its diplomatic policies as well. They shouldn't be as zero sum as they have been. So I guess one thing that surprises me a little bit is he, when we hear the Biden administration's rhetoric on China, so far it has been remarkably similar to the Trump administration's, right? So, you know, there's also this emphasis on strategic competition. Uh, I think the press secretary uh, in one of the briefings also mentioned China's economic abuses and, you know, China's sort of malicious influence over international organizations, China's forced tech transfers, and also this idea of we need to hold China accountable. Um, which is what the Trump administration's officials have repeatedly highlighted in public remarks in the last four years. So do you expect the Biden administration's approach to China to be different from the Trump administration's? Well, I think the Biden administration is certainly going to be different in its approach to China, despite some of the rhetoric that has been used already by some Biden um, officials uh, about China and about Asia. I think there is a need, a perceived need to uh, be able to reflect that the Biden administration is simply not going to return to the policies of the Obama administration and earlier in dealing with China, that there is a greater recognition now that China's activities in a variety of different areas are much more assertive in ways that do uh, potentially or actually threaten American interests. So that I think uh, that will, that will um, continue. You're not going to get a simple return to the past. But the real key question is, 
what is what how are the policies going to differ from the Obama administration? Many of the officials in the Obama administration uh, in the Biden administration, pardon me, are from the Obama administration. Okay. Um, they were all part of those engagement policies in the past. I think they they still believe that engagement is essential with China. I mean, it's ridiculous actually to say that we can't have an engagement policy with China. We have to engage the Chinese. Even the Trump administration at some points spoke about the need to have some level of engagement. But the Biden administration has yet to really clearly lay out where it would proceed with uh, competitive policies towards China uh, and where it would proceed with more cooperative policies designed to build some level of trust and understanding between the US and China. Um, no one has really laid this out yet. That's why I think the Biden administration needs to undertake a, a China policy review to really reassess these different issues. Yes, in some areas, the United States needs to continue to press China and to develop more effective ways of influencing China, but it's not gonna happen simply as a result of piling on ever greater levels of deterrence and then trying to decouple from China in so many areas, economics, technology, uh, students, inter interpersonal interactions. The Trump administration was doing all of that and that has to stop. Um, we're not gonna have decoupling with China uh, in, a, in, a, in a complete way and it would be damaging to the United States if we did. Uh, we need to be able to develop a more balanced and a more pragmatic policy that genuinely recognizes the need to preserve certain types of contacts and interactions with China while at the same time showing clearly that the United States is not going to um, not going to push be pushed back or to compromise hugely on certain vital interests that the United States holds. So that all has to be worked out. And um, I'm sure that the uh, Biden administration, which is very focused on domestic issues right now, has a lot on its plate, but it needs to get at this issue fairly soon. And it needs to do so in particular because the dynamic is so negative between the US and China and it's influencing issues, as we said, like Taiwan, which are becoming more dangerous. And that is the one area where the US and China could really confront each other militarily is over Taiwan. I see, you know, as you mentioned, uh, sort of people point to the fact that many of the uh, Biden administration's China hands are actually alums from the previous Obama administration. Uh, so, you know, we know uh, Biden has appointed a Kurt Kimball as the Asia star, so to speak, to tackle a wide range of challenges from China. We also know there are, you know, other people like Jake Sullivan, who, who is supposed to be, uh, you know, more focusing on China as one of the key policy areas. Well, um, somebody like, I mean, the main person, as you say, will be Kurt Campbell. Um, I've known Kurt for a long time. He actually used to be my sponsor when he was in the Defense Department and I was working at the RAND Corporation. Um, so I've known him a long time. And uh, he's, I think he's vastly superior to uh, the Trump uh, China officials who were in office, particularly in the latter period of the Trump administration. Um, I think he's far more pragmatic uh, than the people in the Trump administration. He's not ideological. Uh, he's focused on, in many cases, what really works. Now, at the same time, I think he's made some, frankly, silly statements uh, in, in various journals about how the extent to which engagement had failed in the past, uh, despite the fact he was centrally involved in it. Um, and, the, and he's kind of stoked the idea that the United States has been just far too accommodating towards China and really looked the other way in, in too many areas in order to preserve a good relationship with China. I think that is a real distortion of the reality of, of the US-China relationship in the past. But Kurt is not somebody who is sort of behind a particular ideological perspective about China. I think he's gonna, as I say, be much more attuned to working with other countries in the region to listen to what they have to say and to reflect uh, their interests as well in, in how he tries to advance US policies in the region. So in terms of comparison with the Trump administration, I just think he, he's much more, uh, much, much better than, than, than uh, people like Matt Pottinger in the, in the, in the White House, uh, Dave Stilwell in the Defense Department and, and others. Uh, there were some good officials in the, in the Trump administration, in my opinion, but they were further down and they were professionals and they were working very hard to try to maintain some level of balance in US-China policies. And they were working you know, uphill or against the tide um, all the time. Uh, in the Biden administration, I think that those officials lower down will have less 
uh, problems in trying to inject more pragmatism and more balance into US policies towards China. Um, I think there are some good people who are gonna be uh, placed in the, in the Pentagon, uh, not um, under the Biden administration and in the White House and in the, um, in the State Department. So I, I hope that they, are will, they will inject a much more, as I say, much more pragmatic and realistic approach to dealing with China and to dealing with Asia and really reassess a lot of the assumptions, particularly the assumption of primacy uh, in US policy in that region. So I expect there will be some real improvements, but the, Trump, you know, the Biden administration really does need to come to grips with what has changed in Asia and what has changed in the world in um, global interests and global security. It needs to develop a much broader definition of what is security in the world and regarding the United States. And it goes way beyond strategic competition with the Chinese. Uh, it goes, I, I don't agree with the idea that the sort of sole defining characteristic of the global order is great power strategic competition. I think that that is a distortion of the reality of the global order and what is really needed to try to sustain peace and stability in that order. We need to move away from the dynamic and the mindset uh, of a kind of Cold War relationship with both China and Russia, um, which is not to excuse the kinds of actions that China and Russia has taken, have taken in certain areas that really do threaten, I think, uh, US interests and they threaten those of our friends and allies in some significant ways. But nonetheless, there are areas where we can work with both countries and we can work with the Chinese and there's, we have ability to be able to shape Chinese interests but we have to be able to engage with China in ways where we're not lecturing them all the time and we're not demanding that they do this or they do that or else. Um, that just will not work. They have to be much more sophisticated and they have to be much more reflective of the idea that we have common interests to work with, to work with China on. All right, thank you so much. It's such a great conversation. Okay. All right, well, thank you great. so much. Okay, Lizzie, take care. Bye, take care. Bye.